Good afternoon, everybody. So it's my pleasure to introduce one of Australia's leading producers, Liz Watts. Liz is the founding partner of Porchlight Films with Vincent Sheehan and Anita Sheehan and producer of many acclaimed and award-winning films and television dramas. Liz, be Liz began her career working in film in the camera department of all places, <laughs> um, but soon realised that she wanted to have a much broader approach. Liz then took on roles at Film Australia, Beyond and Southern Star, and began managing short films, moving on to documentary and narrative features. Liz served as board member of the Sydney Film Festival for five years and as vice president of the board of Metro Screen for six years and is currently a board member of South Australian Film Corporation. Liz joins our conversation on collaboration, bringing a wealth of knowledge and experience, managing the delicate balance of relationships from development to market and on through release. Thank you, Liz, for being with us. I'm sure that you're going to, you're a very <coughs> impressive array of credits. I mean that you uh, be able to give us a good insight into the pros or the challenges at times of collaboration. collaboration yeah. Um, thanks, Julia. No. Look, it's great to be here, and you're going to have to excuse me. I have got um, a paper that I've written, so I'm going to refer to it. And it feels a little odd that I'm sitting down, but we sort of wanted to have a more conversational approach to this. So, um, but it's great to be here in Auckland. It's also really good to be here to learn more about the New Zealand industry because I haven't worked here. Um, per se, and to meet lots of people. So that's been really interesting. Um, and when I was approached by Lucy, you know, the, the, symp the, the, the symposium's ultra title is, you know, strengthening our collaborative spirit. And that has caused me to reflect on what that actually means, because it's a very broad sort of statement. Um, and what does it mean in relation to my work and my career, um, and also, very importantly, my business? And it means many things. <laughs> um, so first, I just wanted to show you a reel, a short reel of Porchlight's work over the years. It's, got not, it's not fully inclusive of everything, but it'll give you an idea of who we are and what our, what our brand is, if you like, if we want to roll that reel. Good Lord. sits in the order somewhere. Everything reaches an understanding. You've 
got to work out where you fit. Very distinctive word. Well, it's sort of interesting when I look at that reel, and it encompasses quite a long number of years, actually. There's some very early work on there. Um, but there's, definite, there's a definite feel and there's a definite brand to, to our work to date. And Vincent and I are the two key creatives in the business, um, and we brought in Tanya Fegan, who was here actually last year, to head up doing um, television, particularly development, with us. Um, and I would say that undoubtedly every single decision we make as a business, Vincent and I are uh, without doubt focused number one on people. People for us are our core, core sort of means of having a career, of finding talent, working with talent. It's all about people and the choices that you make. Um, I'm, I'm currently working with lots of directors that I have worked with previously. Um, and just to give you an overview, really just to show you the sort of relationship scale that I sort of work with. So I'm working with David Michaud on an untitled project with Luke Davies writing, Kate Shortland who did Laura on um, a co-production with Seesaw UK with Tommy Murphy writing with Kate, Justin Kozell who did Macbeth and Snowtown as director on um, True History of the Kelly Gang which is again a um, UK co-production with Daybreak Pictures, Tony Krauts on Murder in Samarkand, which is a whistleblower story with a uh, partnered with a US producer, Tim Perrell, on that. Tony produced, uh, directed Jew Boy and Dead Europe, which I did with them both. Um, plus, first time directors, um, I've been working with David Lindy and Tori Metzger of Lava Bear with a first time Australian um, director. Um, I, I worked with Lindy on The Rover. And a sophomore director whose black rom-com has to be best thing I've read in eons. Um, he was someone that I, Joel Anderson, he was someone that I worked with years and years ago. It, we never got it up, we never got the film up, and it went to bed, but he came back to me just recently with this great script, and I'm hoping that we'll be doing that early next year. And then we're also doing television now, um, much more sort of formally. Um, I've got a series with Kate Blanchett directing that I'm producing with Tony Ayres for Matchbox, um, with whom I did his, or produced his first two feature films, um, and a UK co-production with all people I haven't worked before, but I've known some of them for years. Um, and our TV slate also includes lots of up, upcoming people, um, often, often first-time comedian, often actually with comedy, a lot of first-timers, but also a lot of talent that we think would be great to sort of entice into the television world. Um, so I'm working with Andrew Bavell and Ray Lawrence on a frontier thriller and I've been talking to Andrew Bavell for years about trying to do something with him. So you can see it's all about relationships. The, some of these people are new people that I've worked with, some of them are like sort of entanglements from way down deep years and years and years ago. Um, who we work with and why is paramount to long relationships that encompass creative decisions and business de decisions as well. Um, and fundamental is my ability as a producer to sustain those relationships over a long time, which are vital to, to my working career. So I can't stress your most important choices and decisions are choices about people and who you want to work with. So as a producer, I'd say your key relationships are with so many people, and these are, I'm going to list some, but they're not in order, order of importance by any mean. Um, the audience, the director, the financier, the sales agent, the actor, the writer, the investment manager from the government subsidy place, the publicist, the publisher, the agent, the manager, the distributor, the critic, the festival director, your lawyer, the trailer editor, your assistant. So there are so, and that's just like, that's just off the top of my head. I mean, there's so many people. Um, and so when I think about the, the issue of this, of this symposium, I guess the easiest way for me to tackle it, in a sense, is to go through the stages of what a producer does. So if we start with um, development, which is obviously the, um, the inclination to actually start making something. Um, how do you choose a project? How do you, how do you end up being on a project? Um, and what led you to sort of 
think to yourself that this, this is something that I want to see through for the next five years. Lots of decisions are made and lots of, lots of ideas will come through to you. Um, but in my experience, my development is generally along a number of two, mainly two pathways, which is optioning pre-branded pre or um, existing material or being introduced to it by writers and writer directors slash directors. So, for instance, people like Kate Shortland and David Michaud traditionally have written their own material, um, but that's changing. As people get more and more busy, you introduce writers to them. Um, we watch at Portrait and go after options on novels and manuscripts and real life stories or other sort of inspiring sort of events. But th that's not to say this is always needed, but this is just ways of sort of getting stuff through. And there are many of avenues and sourcing stuff early is always key. <clears throat> so we try and get hold of manuscripts at a very early stage. Um, and these are manuscripts from all around the world. There's some really great database companies um, one called, uh, there's a French company called Bestseller to Box Office, which will, for a subscription fee, send you monthly book reports of every manuscript being published around the world um, in any language and by category. And it's kind of an amazing tool. There's lots of these sort of little things that can enhance your knowledge of the marketplace, basically. Um, in fact, I'd say that knowing publishers in domestically in New Zealand as well as in Australia is a really, really fundamentally great thing for anyone who's in the narrative storytelling business because um, you should get their numbers and try and make contact with them, take them out to lunch, take them out to dinner and get to know them because they are a really underutilised source of really interesting stories that um, I think we tend to sort of we haven't exploited that avenue much in Australia anyway. Um, it also, I guess, development takes shape and form in much, in, in many different ways of, 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 well, there are many processes of development and as we've moved further into television or, or expanding our slate to include television, increasingly we do um, writers' rooms and we work with writers um, across you know, a, a, a television series, but also we're increasingly doing writers' rooms for directors and writers of feature films, and whereby we bring in one or two other brains, if you like, into a room to, to work with us to nut out a narrative sort of development um, for a project. And so you get inspired by this. It's, it's a way of sort of collaborating very, very early on and inviting ideas into um, into the project, which then reflect back later on onto your audience, because they're like your early audience, so you can test things out on them. Um, Before you move on, yeah. So, <clears throat> doing the writers' room around a feature project, what? When would you be doing that? At a point when the script is at first, second, third draft. Pretty early, mm -hmm. actually. Um, it, it, this is just recently in mm -hmm. my experience, and it may change. We may want to do it later on. I, I think it's work. I think it, on a feature, it works, and it's the same with television. Works best early. So, um, for instance, on the Young Romantics is based on a real life story, a historical period film. So we had a researcher involved who obviously had a fount of knowledge. We wanted to move right away from a biopic. Mm -hmm. We don't want it to be a biopic. But it, just having that person there was great. Then we had Tommy and Kate who were writing together. And then we had another writer, Louise Fox, who came in and just spitballed. It's like, it's sort of brainstorming, really. Um, and that, that gave us a checkpoint for Tommy to write the first beat sheet and that kind of an outline or breakdown. Mm. So it was quite early. So um, you, would you would that be something to consider? Do you think when you've got a writer who's bringing a script to you or you've commissioned, um, when a writer can be very protective? Yeah, yeah, and opening the, it up. Yeah, adaptation. Well, that would be hard. To, to, would that be an interesting thing to manage for a writer? Absolutely. Mm. I think I think if you've got a writer who's ad adapting their play. Um, for instance, having other writers in the room. That, I mean, it can be confronting, but it's a, it's a way of opening up the sort of discussion. So, introducing new characters, for instance. Mm -hmm. 
it's uh, there are so many ways of developing projects, and and your key people are obviously the writer and the director that you're working with. Um, on television, it's it's fundamentally the writer, and on feature films, for myself, it's the director, but also the writer. Mm. So. Um, the producer-writer relationship is fascinating, I think. And it's complicated. A, and complicated, <laughs> yeah. Well, need some demyst you have to demystify it well, for us a little what bit. I was going to say, one of the biggest problems we've got in Australia at the moment is a sort of um, a talent pool, experienced talent pool that's declining because it keeps getting nicked by LA and London. So we, we're often, you know, there's what, there's probably 20 production companies or there's probably 15 really active production companies in Australia and we're all competing for the same writers quite often who are seen by the broadcasters, for instance, to be, um, to be kind of bankable. Um, so as a producer, I'm con you know, constantly sort of looking at stuff um, as much as possible. And um, What sort of stuff? Well, if I refer back to, say, directors, shorts, um, I'm always looking at shorts. Uh, I'm working with a young um, director named Miranda Nation who should I saw Perception uh, won the Dendy Awards in Australia at Sydney Film Festival, which is a really great um, platform for short films to get seen. And I happened to see that short and I really liked it and I called the meeting with her and um, because I felt that she has a talent, basically, and we've ended up, we're developing a feature film called Zero Circle that she's written. So it is, I mean, as a producer, your job is to be finding talent constantly um, and, and trying to encourage new talent, but often time is really hard and it's a time management sort of ratio that you have to, <laughs> have to do. Um, anyway. Um, I guess the other thing, I mean, the, the fundamental thing at the end of the day is the audience and who your audience is. My job is to kind of nut out who and what marketplace you're, um, you're developing stuff for. And I think you go through trends. I think um, at the moment, uh, two very family-focused family, family -focused films have done extra really, really well at the Australian box office. So, you know, Screen Australia's just announced an initiative for developing a family, family film. Um, and that's, that's great because it, 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 they've done well because they're... they're um, they're pitched at adults who are sick of the franchises. So, and then school holidays, they're, they're great alternative pr programming. So, who your project is for, and, and, and obviously um, that has been shifted a lot with the rise of television across the world and the platform of, of being able to tell stories of a, at a high end um, in a longer form. And if you look at most UK production houses now, they will have a television slate um, involved and, and incorporated into their business structure. And it's something that we've, we formally took on about two and a half years ago at Porchlight. Um, even though we'd sort of been doing TV, you know, un sort of informally, we, we wanted to say, okay, yeah, we're making a commitment to this to actually get broadcast stuff up. For um, what was the real catalyst for that decision? Well, I, uh, the the ability to tell to work with writers and to tell longer stories over a, you know to tell more in depth character stories over a longer um, amount of eps basically. Mm -hmm. um, so if you look at you, I think if you look at you have to be looking at the kind of audience end all the time. And I know that that's not a collaboration one single person, but the collaboration that you make as a producer has to also involve what you're giving to an audience and what you're actually asking them to pay for, ultimately. Um, in television on the Australian free-to-air networks, and also I see it on HBO and Netflix, there's a propensity for branded entertainment of some kind. So based on real life is really big um, in Australia at the moment with you know, they've just had the Peter Allen story and there's an underbelly, true crime franchises. Um, and so trends are really identifiable and reading the trend, trades and everything can tell you a lot about that stuff and also talking to commissioners as well. Um, and I guess the other biggest thing is that we're working increasingly in an international marketplace. Um, we make films definitely 
at Portchlight that we need to sell internationally, not just domestically. Otherwise, it won't work. Um, and so, but then there's different new platforms, and that's what's really exciting. Um, at the moment, I think you're living in a in a kind of world where SVOD and VOD providers are crossing with cable and, and different networks and um, free-to-air bro broadcasters. And understanding what those platforms are looking for is is really um, a very important thing for your as a producer for your sort of um, ongoing ability to collaborate with anyone. Um, Netflix is, you know, is certainly a very, very interesting model of, of narrative storytelling and uh, at the moment they're only commissioning internationally for AN, you know, Australasia, but that will certainly change. Um, and you know, there's Amazon and what's Apple going to do next and Google. So all of those platforms are really exciting avenues and places of exploitation basically. Um, for your product. Are you developing projects with those platforms Absolutely. in mind specifically? Absolutely. Absolutely. Still considering them as a, are you thinking multi-platform or are you just thinking I'm going to be sending those projects straight to VOD? I'm thinking Amazon will take a feature film soon mm. of ours. So I, think I would hope. Yeah. Um, and if you look at you look at the length, I think someone we were talking about not being able to keep up with watching all that series stuff. And I think I, I have a theory that the length of those um, series are going to come down in part. Um, but the, there's talent behind those, like, you know, Olive Kitteridge, I don't know if anyone's seen that, but mm. it was directed by Lisa Cholodenko, and then Paul Haggis did Show Me a Hero. Like, amazing directors behind this stuff. And um, it's, it's another avenue and it's another way of, of cultivating the talent um, as well, and enticing talent. So you can go to a director and say, hey, why don't we do this series? This is something you haven't done before. You've only worked in features. Now, in New Zealand, I'm not sure that, I, I know this is a film sort of symposium. We can talk to you into it. <laughs> but I'm going to have to talk about television as well, because it's just a fact. It's a, a fact of life. Um, I think perhaps we've been a little, I don't know how easy it is to entice a film for someone who's committed to film to TV in this country, that's right. something that um, has been more challenging. Or, yeah. But, you know, we, and the other question I wanted to ask you about developing for um, drama series, what do you think of putting, um, say you've got a drama series that you do, that you're looking to commission, television, but you're not having the luck perhaps because you've got newer talent behind it, newer writers. What do you think about creating smaller work for online, building an audience? Yeah, I was going to, actually, I did get, I, I do I get to that. I jumped too far forward. Um, because I was going to, the, there's two parts, is developing and also then selling, and how you sell, and what you use as an asset to sell. Um, uh, uh, sorry, sell, sell the concept to someone, mm. if you like. Mm. And, and there's obviously, in the past, it's always been short films. Short films are undoubtedly a great show, you know, card um, to show people. And David Michaud's film Crossbow, mm. I, I saw, and that enticed me to him. I could then use that with the closing of the finance and getting um, the sales agent uh, who became E1 on board. And so... You know, short films and perception, as I just mentioned, for this young director I'm working with. So short films are really, really great calling card. Increasingly, I'm seeing um, stuff on YouTube and the web, sort of the web series or that notion of a web series is definitely um, rising. And actually, Screen Australia has a little bit of an attitude that the cream will rise to the top mm. because of the, of the net. And I'm, I sort of, I'm... Not so sure about that because I don't think dramatic material works as well on YouTube as, say, comedy does. So I'm working with the Van Vuren brothers in Australia who did a series, a great series, really smart, clever and funny, um, called um, Soulmates for the ABC. But they started off on YouTube and they cultivate their audience really early um, and they work because it's comedy and it works in five-minute download, you know, or, you know, whatever the buffering can do. Um, I don't think David's film Crossbow would have done anything on YouTube. Mm. But, you know, so it, it, there's definitely, there's also, you know, Skit Box is a, a group of young girls who did this great skit called Active Wear, which I don't know if anyone's seen it, but 
It got 10 million views in a week. So they're now doing a series for Pivot in the US. So you can see how th that platform definitely has, it's an incredible opportunity for people. And we would work, we've just done a pilot um, for ABC TV called The Record, which was a, on their iView platform only. Mm, so interesting, how's that going? ABC are testing out mm. people on that platform. Great. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I guess there's lots of ways of selling your project and then also utilising that kind of um, um, existing material in order to get your project financed. Mm. Um, but, but you've got to position the project to financiers in a way that makes sense. And knowing what the marketplace is doing is, is really fundamental to that and understanding what everyone else is doing and understanding what a sales agent in the US is doing as opposed to someone in France and, and so on is very, very important. Um, just jumping back a little, I can, you've de you've, there's no doubt that you've really followed people's careers. When you first start working with somebody new, are you thinking long term with them? Are you, do you actually think, or do you really focus on the project that's in front of you and it's a more organic? I, it, it is. I don't, I don't, I don't um, I think that maybe if you're picking up someone that's so um, rough and young, or not rough, but someone that is very... Unpolished, Ill, perhaps. Unpolished, yeah, yeah a, unpolished gem. Then you're hoping that they will then go on to do to other things, of course, because you're investing your time in that. Mm. Um, I, I don't tend to sort of plan out that I'm going to work with someone again until I work with them. Because mm. it's, a, it's a very personal... Um, experience and, and to go through the production, the whole of the development, production and release phase with someone is a very, very, one. it's a marriage, you know, you're married to them um, and your life is very entwined. And I used to have a kind of saying that I only work with people that I want to have dinner with because I think that's a really good measure. Oh, that's good. Um, but it, it, yeah, it's a bit short-sighted, really. When you're putting <coughs> the, the development, book, um, the finance package together, are you thinking about the... Is, are relationships important from just who, who all the people you're going to bring together? Yeah, well, I was going to say, right, I mean, I haven't talked about cast yet, but obviously your relationship with the agents entails that you're going to get the script to, uh, uh, hopefully, the right actor. Your relationship with the sales agent means that you, you can beg for that extra 2% mm. to close the finance. Um, and, and so... Having that understanding of all those people is really, really critical. Um, and going through into the marketplace, what, one thing I would say is to travel. For me, travelling has been absolutely undeniably necessary um, where I live on the other side of the planet and where you guys all live too, um, to most people. Because you, you've got to get an understanding of the other systems of the world and an empathetic view of how those people are working and what they want. You know, what does that distributor in France, why do they care about your film? Um, they probably will if you explain it to them in terms that they, they can understand, but you've got to understand what their terms are first. So for me, going to Berlin Film Festival, going to, having films that allowed me to go was was really great. Um, and I think the first film I went with was a short film and a feature film the same year at Berlin. And then participating in um, co-production markets as much as possible, I think is a really great way of kind of building that network of, un of people around you. Um, there's Rotterdam, Rotterdam was one of the first co-production markets in the world. And um, I think I, I did it three times. I've done Berlin a few times. And, I've, you know, I think the first time I went to Cannes uh, in, like, 2000 or something, I just couldn't believe it. I was just like, my God, there, are so, there is so much being made, which is intimidating, but at the same time, you sort of go, well, why not? Why can't we do it, you know? If they're just doing get on it. it. They're doing it. Why can't I do it? Um, so I, I, I would say that you have to really... You have to get a amongst it and, and symposiums like this are really great because you're talking to people and you're um, you know you're reaching out to people in the American parlance I guess. When you go to a market would you be you, you taking three or four projects in mind that you're um, that you're hoping to pitch do you have what's your secret for slightly off collaboration but it's about gaining a relationship 
what is your secret to doing that first little pitch? How do you get someone to start to like you and like your project? Yeah, it's hard. Give us I a think, tip. Well, I think <laughs> the first time I went to Canada, I was pitching a film called, which ended up becoming called, uh, becoming, sorry, ended up being called um, Walking on Water. It was called Live and Let Die. It was like the worst title of a film ever. Um, and I knew, I kind of knew it when I was trying to talk to people about it, but it really drove home, you know, that, I, that thing of being really careful with when you go out. Um, I, think, I think the biggest thing is doing the research on who you're seeing and seeing and looking at exactly what they're selling. Um, I'm, if I'm talking about pitching to sales agents, um, you're, you've, you're often at the end of the market, they're tired, they've, they've been dealing with distributors all, all, like all the way through for those first four or five days. They're kind of, they're maybe a little bit more open by the time you see them, hopefully. Um, but it's fast and you don't have a lot of time to make an impression. I, I'm not a big pitcher, I'm not a hard pitcher, I don't go in hard, I'm just not that kind of performer. Um, and for me it's about a conversation and it's about working out what they want and, and they always, they need stuff. Just, you know, distributors, sales agents, US agents need stuff. They all need, it's like the, the world is made up of content and we're generating it so we have power. It's just no, it's knowing what they want from you and what they expect is really critical. Um, and then forming that partnership with them, it is a partnership, and they're going to bring stuff to you besides money. They're going to bring a whole lot of knowledge of marketplace and, and how to sell. And you've got to listen to them and at the same time form your own ideas about where the audience is. Um, and I think that's where things like YouTube and, and cultivating an online presence really early on is really critical for building an audience for, for the eventual release mm. of, say, a feature film. Um, so you're saying, yeah, mutual, the mutual relationships, that's what I'm hearing. Yeah, there are. So you approach, you're not, you're trying to approach in the perspective yeah, I that don't, you've got a strength yeah, and a position, yeah. you've got something to offer. Yeah, I think that you're not just going after a dollar. Um, I mean, you are. <laughs> But at the same time, you're going after a lot of other... There's a, there's a, there's a whole lot of things you're going after there. Um, with Film Nation on the Rover, you know, it's like one of the, the preeminent sales agents in the world. Mm -hmm. And they... But we knew that they were the right... Had the right understanding of the genre and of what David was going to do and wouldn't be shocked by it at the end of the day. And also they could sell it around the world. Um, so it's sort of really thinking about what that what that, um, that agency has sold before and what their, what their dance card looks like, mm. if you like. Research, research, yeah. research. And that's, that goes the same. We just did a panel before about agents and packaging and I'd say, you know, your other your critical relationship is with, that, with the cast. Um, you know, they're working with the director, pri you know, pr <coughs> primarily, but for a producer, Understanding why an actor wants to do your film or might want to do your film is really important in your ability to then pitch to the agent and manager why they should do this film. So the easiest example is Rob Pattinson was sick of being... Well, he was not sick, but what he kind of was, he was sick of being the Twilight guy. So we knew that, and we knew that from, from um, looking at his immediate past films, and we were able to... Uh, approach the agent on that basis. So it's all about knowledge, it's all about gaining knowledge and research and uh, a lot of that stuff you find out online. You can just get, garner it from articles and, and so on. So um, I think that, so you, you definitely have to understand also the difference between managers and agents and um, the US system as opposed to the UK system. Um, as opposed to the own, your own domestic um, agent system. But you have to have a relationship with agents. I think if, if anyone is in this room who's a producer, um, you know, within their lives, they will have <laughs> some kind of relationship with an agent. I mean, I, I work with agents all the time. We, we've got, um, you know, format, format rights. Um, Animal Kingdom's been made into a series in the US at the moment. And by John Wells, who did West Wing, and that's they've just shot the pilot. So, UTA repped us on that 
deal. Um, Laid, which is an ABC comedy that we did, has been optioned about a hundred times by UK and US people and hopefully finally is going ahead with this US production company. And, and so agents aren't just there about cast. Increasingly, they're kind of, they're taking up the whole sort of process, if you like, um, from the initial, you know, film lit people that know, that are chasing the same manuscripts that you are, um, to actors, to financiers, to release, um, and they're repping you for domestic sales. So they are a big fact of life as well. If you're an earlier career producer and maybe you've, you know, you're just starting to go out to market for the first time, how on earth do you even start a relationship with a sales? You know, an agent is pretty tough, let alone an American agent, but even just a sales agent. I mean, but the sales tips agent, there? I think, I mean, I, you do it just on the basis, you do it almost on naivety. Um, I think that they, everyone, what I said before about we're content providers, everyone wants content. They still need it, even though the platforms are changing and the and the durations might be changing and how we release stuff, whether it's day and date, whether it's not. All of that still is fundamentally about producing stories mm. and visual stories. Um, and so at the end of the day, a sales agent can size you up and go, if I don't take that meeting, I might just missed out on blah, blah, mm. you know? So it, no one gotta, wants to miss out, do no they? No one wants to miss out. No. The US agent doesn't want to miss out. No, they really don't want to miss out. I think using advocates for you, for your film, is really good. And I know Jane Campion's done that mm. with people in Tacan. Um, so I think you have to sort of think about, you know, maybe you get an executive producer on board who can help you into, um, or a mentor. I mean, I, the first time I went to Cannes, I was lucky enough to meet a sales agent Fortissimo, Walter Barendrecht, who is a Dutch-based, well, they're Hong Kong, they were Hong Kong-based um, sales agency. And they represented like the best, some of the best filmmakers in the world at that moment, like Wong Kar Wai and others, mm -hmm. like really inspiring people who I loved. And he, he unofficially as a mentor and then a very firm friend became a, a great source of knowledge to me. And I think you end up finding those people in your pathway if you're looking for it. If you're open. If you really blink it, then you're not going to see that. But if you keep yourself wide open and curious enough, you'll find those people. And they do, often they can act as advocates for you um, and become really helpful in getting your foot in that door, that sales agent, mm. um, or, or particularly an agent, mm. actually. And often it's the assistants with agents Always be polite to the assistants. Mm. Should be polite Always. to everyone all the time. I mean, you should. <laughs> exactly right. Exactly right. Um, a bit of, mm. Sorry. It's easy to start asking questions and then no, no, stop that's you good. on your flow. That's good. Yeah, I was just. I think that. Um, I think maybe we'll just roll the rover. The. Can we do the rover clip? Because I'll just talk about partnering with other producers. Yeah, fabulous. Yeah, fabulous. Yeah, fabulous. I tell you what, God's given you. He's put a bullet in you, and he's abandoned you out here to me. He feels nothing for you. Your brother left you to die. That's what people do. You don't learn to fight. Your death's going to come real soon. The rover was. Um, we made that after Animal Kingdom had done you know, pretty well in terms of raising the um, visibility and kind of recognisability of David Michaud. And we, I, on that film, I partnered with a, um, a US producer by the name of David Lindy, and um, he's, he just set up a company called Lava Bear Films. And um, it's, it's, I guess it was a really interesting process for me to partner with someone of that stature, because um, I hadn't worked. I'd worked with other producers. I'd worked with Emile Sherman and Ian Canning um, of Seesaw um, in Australia and the UK, and, and lots of other people over the years. But David Lindy was the first US producer I'd worked with. Um, and he brought so much, I learned so much in, um, that was like my eighth feature. But he was able to impart so much knowledge simply because of his experience. He used to run, um, Universal Studios. Mm. He 
he started Good Machine, which inspired myself and Vincent to even think that we could run a production company. Um, and I guess what understanding the differences of approach by other producers is a really um, important thing to, to garner. And part of that travelling thing is also meeting other producers and seeing how people work in different finance systems um, and different sort of roles that people may take on. And I think matching skill sets is a really important thing um, as a producer that you always are trying to do. You may, be, you may be really great on script, but not so good, you don't like the shoot, so you need someone that is besides a line producer, but maybe a more creative producer who is there on the shoot, or I'm sort of, I, I like doing both, or you, like, or you need someone that can really bring market um, money from the UK, so you partner with that person in the UK. But it's a, it's a relationship that is a very, very important one because it becomes a creative determinant, um, determining feature, if you like, of the production. If you have a, a, a sort of imbalance of um, finance to the table and no real lead producer, you can often get, the project can fall over and can become a mess. And that's a really sort of fundamentally horrible thing when that happens. So. Which, yeah, mm. we can. <laughs> when you're looking for a co-producing partner, like other than, so yes, you are going to look for somebody who's got a complementary skill, but how do you, I mean, that's not so, e you can't, when you're just starting to get to know someone who potentially as we, is going to be married to you yeah. for the next yeah, however yeah. many years while you make this yeah. project and try and get the finance. So, what advice could you give just about managing even Developing how developing the relationship yeah. in terms of how much communication you need, well, how much you should be in the <coughs> same room when you're in other countries, those yeah. kind of things. I know you end up doing endless Friday night phone calls mm. um, forever. Um, it's uh, look, it's it's really it's a tricky thing. It's like how do you find someone? How do you start dating Fall someone? In love. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. You just you sort of react, but. It's sort of, um, it is really hard and reputation is everything, you know. Don't let people say reputation doesn't count. It does. And asking people what they're like and finding out and doing your intel underneath and going around and seeing who they've worked with before and talking to that person or those people. And um, it, it is a really, it's, a, it's sort of a long sort of process, you know, because you... You take that very seriously. Yeah, 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 absolutely. It's a very, very serious thing because you're going into business with someone and um, you've got to be able to rely on them, you've got to be able to trust them. And um, it's, um, you know, it's all, and hopefully you, you're each learning from each other as well. I think um, every project is so different and so individual that you can't help but be struck. I'm always like, oh, hang on, how do I do this? Oh, yeah, I've sort of done that before. So I can apply those skills to that. When so. you're starting a co-production relationship, is it, do you, pers do you think it's a good idea to bring in a third party to negotiate the terms of that? Or you would always handle no, that? No, I think you should do it. I think, um, I don't, th I mean, you've got lawyers, obviously. Of course, yeah. And your lawyer is your best friend, mm. always. Um, hopefully, you should have a good lawyer because that's another relationship, relationship that's very key as producer. Um, but I think that you should be able to determine from your own gut instinct what, and, and then, but by really checking on people, what, what should be done and how, how to treat that person and how they should, how you should sit in terms of your roles. Mm. But really being upfront about that, I think it's really the best way of approaching it as mm. well. Um, and if a producer approaches you, you know, I think... New Zealand's got amazing, the amazing offset rebate of 40% for both, both film and television. And that's a really great position to say to co-producers in other producers in, say, Europe, you know, come and shoot here. Look what we can do. I think there's a real opportunity there. Um, I know that most people will want to generate their own material, but for a long-term career, it's sort of often looking at partnering with people in order to build your production base, in order to be in production more often and to, to actually get fees and paid. I there. think in, there is a perception that the Australians don't really want to work with us. 
<laughs> but that's not true. Is that, who thinks that's a perception? I don't know, maybe it's just me. But what do you think? I mean, you haven't done one... Well, is New one... Zealand doing anything with Australia? Well, there's a few it things. It goes both ways. It goes both ways, I'd think. Say. I mean, Slow West was done, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, with do you Rachel. Th but do you... So, I know your state is very full and so on, but... Um, there hasn't been as much collaboration between no. the countries as you perhaps would have thought. I think that we should be looking, uh, yeah, which is a bit dumb. Well, I, I guess maybe we're the smaller partner. We, yeah, us getting over there, there's probably more business happening in Australia than here. Yeah, well, it's a slightly bigger industry. So do you have any tips less, for us less going money over? in the pool, yeah, maybe, I, I gather, from yeah. what Matthew was saying yeah, earlier. Yeah. Um, but do you have any tips for uh, producers here who think they have... Um, again, it's looking at people's slate. Like, don't... If, I'm not saying don't come and see me because I'm full, but don't look at me and go, oh, well, I'll take your Liz, that animation, because she's never done animation. Like, I don't know anything about animation. Um, it's, yeah, it's really looking at who, who you want to target and look at what they've done and see, oh, well, they've worked with that person. I know that person who is like that person. So maybe I could say, well, this person's a bit like Justin Curzel, mm -hmm. you know, um, or whatever, you mm -hmm. know. I think um, Are there, a lot of there other definitely needs to be more mm -hmm. to and fro. You, you know? have to help us in this. Okay. Okay, <laughs> figure out. So you're on a lot of boards. I think I read that. Yeah, no, we are. <laughs> we are. Well, we're trying to get people, if you should all come and shoot in South Australia. Okay. <laughs> Anyone got any ideas? Yeah. I'm but, a producer. I yeah. <laughs> yes. Anyway, um, well, uh, talking of co-productions, I did a. Well, maybe we showed the the Laura clip, please. That was an interesting one because it was a. It was based. Laura was a, a, a story from a novella written by a German Australian writer, which was optioned by an English producer who brought on Kate Shortland, the Australian director, who brought on me as the Australian producer. It's a totally uh, German story based in um, uh, the end of World War II and it's about a Nazi young girl or girl that's been brought up in a Nazi household and her, her siblings. And so we ended up getting then, I've, I sort of formed a partnership with Paul, the English producer, and we got a German producer on. Because obviously it's an incredibly German story but we felt it was a resounding story for, of course, the world. Um, and I think that that was a really interesting, for me, probably the hardest film I've ever financed and made. Um, in terms of a collaboration, it was, you know, my relationship with Kate was very strong and, and with Paul, but there was never a lead producer as such um, stated up front and fundamentally it, it really made things very, very tricky. Um, and the finance was an overly complicated finance plan which had a, a, like about 20 rebates out of the German states because we shot all around Germany. So we were getting rebates wherever Gosh, we shot. A nightmare. Which was a nightmare. So it meant that um, there, was a, there was an imbalance between the finance to the, to the, to the needs and the creative needs. And... Um, it, it, when that happens, you have to. It's it's one of those relationship things where you have to go back to your core principles of what's um, going to make things happen. <laughs> As a producer, that's what your job is. You make things happen, and um, we, you know, we got through it. I'm really proud of it. But you know, I, I think I was going to quit about a hundred times on that film, and um, you know, it was very very tough, and there were a lot of screaming matches. And between. too many lawyers and screaming it was a matches between <laughs> who who were the screaming matches between, between the other producers. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I, I just I use it as an example because I learnt so much mm. about trusting your gut instinct and So you think you didn't I didn't trust it early enough. Mm. So you might not There's have done a point it. where we no, I might have got out of that we may have got someone a different. Different structure. Mm. So it's Because you talked about the power structure of finance. Yeah, so it's, it's really important. If you have a if you end up with a situation where you as a producer aren't in control, if you like, of the finance plan, it can and your and your main relationship is with the director. Um, and you can't serve that director or you can't I, don't, I hate using the word serve, but you can't support and um, assist structure. that mm. director to to make the film, then you know it's it's you it's a very very it's not a great situation to be in. 
It's debilitating. Are you happy with the film? Yeah, really happy. Mm. Very, very happy. And I think it's a really beautiful film. Um, and it was a film that, you know, did very well and it's done well around the world and did okay in the US. Um, so it's, you know, went to Toronto and all the rest of it. So, so was it a cultural, was it a, was it, that that's was a cultural The other problem? thing I was going to say, working with someone in the US is very different to working with people in France or Germany or even the UK. And I think the more you open yourself up to the different finance systems and, and, and you need to understand the Australian system as much as I need to understand the New Zealand system. As you get, as you garner that sort of knowledge, you realise that there's definitely cultural differences that you have to be aware of and you have to be um, empathetic to and understand. Um, same with working with Hong Kong or Singapore, which I've, I've worked with Singapore. And although they have a government system that's not dissimilar to ours, so. Um, but yeah, I think, I mean, coming, coming back down to your key relationships, number one is obviously the director with feature films and the writer, I find more and more so with um, television. And everything I sort of do as a producer is, is to give my key creative collaborator which is, who, say, the director on a feature film, give them the ability to do their best work. That's what you want. That's what you, everything is set up for. That's what the, when you started doing those budgets, you know, two years before, um, it's a, that's a map of the whole film and you should be able to see the whole film in your head. Um, you should know what your director's going to say next. That's your job. Because, and, there, and there'll be times where they'll be so over, you know, worked and overwhelmed with questions, particularly in pre-production, that you need to be able to help them by answering those questions as well. Um, and that's definitely something that you, you know, you asked me earlier about starting, you know, do, when you start working with a director, I don't know if I'm going to work with them again mm. until I've finished, until we've released. Mm. I really don't. But obviously you've been um, fortunate or worked very, very hard at your relationships in that you've taken yeah. your directors through and you have a lot of um, projects. Yeah, and I, and I think with television it's slightly different because the turnover's, you know, sort of quicker um, and it's a little bit different in the sense that things aren't... Um, aren't uh, well, actually, we do develop with directors in the room with writers, but often the directors are coming in later um, and it's really the writer who are the key creators with us and um, um, and, and, and they may be right directors. Actually, television is also a great way to test out directors and see if, um, you know, maybe you can go on to doing other bigger, longer form. How do you manage the relationship between... So you've got your... You've, you've developed the script to a certain point and you're wanting to bring your director in. How, and whether or not that director knows that writer, how do you manage the director-writer relationship as a producer? That, yeah, it's tricky. I think um, it, 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 it's, everything is very different. Every project is different. So Tommy Murphy working with Kate Shortland is very different to Chris Merska is writing, who's, who's done a lot of television in Australia, is writing a feature film with four Tony Crowets. Um, and they're, they're, they're definitely got a key kind of creative one-on-one -on -one relationship, but I've sat in the room with them both um, and talked through, uh, you know, ideas and stuff in terms of before Chris did the, the, the first breakdown. And I think that you kind of... I mean, the director... Most directors are so keen to be working anyway. Mm. It's not like they're going to be sort of like down at the beach or something. They <laughs> just like they want to be working. Everyone wants to work. Um, do you in have my to experience. Pr protect your writer a little bit from the Do director? you think about that? Uh, yeah, I sort of think the other way with features though. Okay, interesting. I think with features, I guess my I am on my natural leaning is to get the, the 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 script to the point where the director it becomes their film because ultimately it is their film. Um, and so it needs to get. You need to be sort of coercing the the writer almost into that thinking like that director. Mm -hmm. So Sean Grant is doing the Peter Kelly, um, the Ned Kelly, Peter Kelly book adaptation of, of Ned, Ned Kelly, Kelly. <laughs> um, and 
he knows Justin very well, obviously from Snowtown. And we had another writer on previously and it didn't quite work. But Sean has sort of, I just read it last, actually on Friday, and he's delivered a really great draft. And I can see that he is thinking like Justin. He knows oh, that cool. is Justin's going to be the one directing. And Justin will end up doing a polish on it anyway. Mm. Um, so most of the directors I work with would. So you would have an open and so say it wasn't a relation, it wasn't a writer who had worked with the director. Would you be having a, a quite an open discussion with your writer about that? Yeah, about yeah. starting to think towards yeah, your director. Yeah, ultimately, absolutely. I think that that's why getting them in the room together is really good. I think right at the beginning, you need to be really open in that communication, and there needs to be that kind of dialogue. Um, and they should go and see some movies together or something. Or you know, they need to be looking at influences or. You know, what if it was sort of like this film or it was that film or no, we don't want to make that film. Like this is a good not to make film. Mm -hmm. You know, often there are those references you need to have. I like that. I often think about that in, um, in that um, creative triangle of producer, writer, director, that how important it is that everybody's making the same film yeah, and yeah. often and yeah. it can easily happen that that's not the case. Yeah, absolutely. And that's where the fi control of the finance is really important mm -hmm. too. Um, um, I don't know. We haven't got a huge amount of time, yep. so have a little think about what else. But I also I think we should definitely talk about your relationship with Screen Australia, as we've just come off the back of oh yeah yeah of, of Dave And I talking. thought it was I was really interested. Um, obviously, I was going to talk about women and men <laughs> um, because you know I'm a woman. Um, <laughs> but I guess working, I was interested to hear Dave talking about um, um, the equality. Um, mechanisms, if you like, and it's certainly not a quota system, I gather. Um, but, you know, I think that's something that we're all pretty aware of in terms of our working relationships and trying to encourage women directors back into the um, industry. And I think, you know, we've got big problems in Australia in terms of childcare and support. Um, and I've spoken on panels and stuff with Elizabeth Broderick, who's a sex discrimination person. And it's you know, those issues aren't going to go away and, and, the, and the ways of seeing and the ways of telling a story are um, really interesting to look at and the way we critique films as well. Um, you know, producers, as producers we all have, and, and producers of, of content, we have relationships with critics as well and um, the audience. And if the audience is only seeing one form of storytelling, it's a pretty dire thing. Um, so that was really interesting and I know that Screen Australia is reportedly looking at a quota system and I'm not sure what's going to happen with that mm. but, um, you know, Screen Australia, I have a, you know, very good relationship with all of the state bodies as much as I can um, plus Screen Australia and I know the investment managers very well, I know Graham Mason and it's, I go out of my way to, to know who's doing, who's new and uh, what's happening and what the budget cuts. Generally, it's knowing when the budget cuts are coming um, and knowing who's got money left because uh, we run out of... The government agencies regularly pretty well run out of money before the end of the financial year uh, board meeting. So that's that happens all the time, um, which is a problem. And how... So the other thing that was coming up um, with Dave was the amount of input the Film Commission are having in our productions, yeah. especially in production or in the leadership. Is that something that is discussed or is an issue in Australia? Look, it, it, it is discussed. It's always discussed a bit. Um, How do you feel I, about it? Well, I, I, it doesn't impact me. It hasn't impacted me lately. Um, I, I tend not to get development money through them, and so that, for instance, doesn't really affect me. Um, <coughs> We match fund a lot. I have a lot of money out of Film 4, to be honest. And that's a very selective pro That's mm. very, that, you know, you want to mm. thinking about having an influence. They have a huge influence. Um, but luckily, they're the, like the right kind of influence for hopefully our projects. Um, and so it, it, it is a very debatable point because you're a taxpayer, you know, why have they got that much influence? Are they a studio? I think you have to be re really careful of having that kind of studio approach as a government agency. Um, it, it can be, um, especially when people aren't taking responsibility for their decisions and when it becomes a, 
decision by committee. So you get a, you get a number of, say, script reports on one script. And if, there's a, if it becomes a consensual thing, I think that is dangerous. I'd actually prefer one person made up their mind and said it and you could critic them back. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's worse when it's a blind sort of dark hole that it goes into and it's bit back out at you. <laughs> so you, you sort of, so with film four, which I can, um, how would you describe the power in that relationship when you're having quite a lot of finance from an organisation like that? Well, we have, it, in the end, film four probably won't invest more than about 5%. Oh, okay. So they, but they're, they're developing, so they have the development money early and that's what's very attractive. Um, and, they, and it becomes their mantle, their banner on your film is a, is a powerful tool for you then to go out and get so-and-so and Michael Fassbender or something, if you want, you know, for Everybody instance. Wa Everyone Michael. wants Michael Fassbender. <laughs> I just so. love it. I don't think I've been to one talk where Michael where Fassbender hasn't come up. <laughs> and I, like, all right, and He's I was, not in any of my films. Yeah, either. okay. None. I just, I think you shouldn't just no, because. No, maybe Ned Kelly, I don't know. Anyway. <laughs> Okay, cool. Uh, so yes. do you want... Yes. Five minutes. Well, um... I was, I was just going to say, yeah. in, in... Look, my... It is a ramble, this speech. There's talk. so much to talk about. I know, there is. It's so wide because we haven't even got to the release part where you're still working with distributors and you're working with publicists and you're working with your own publicist and, and then you're selling the format rights and you're back to the US agent again and um, it goes on and on. And I guess... The collaboration for me means communication, knowledge, trustability, reputation, and ultimately um, some kind of match skilling. And all of those factors happen in, in lots of different ways, in lots of different relationships. But at the end of the day, you can't work without people. So. And the last thing, how important is it to compromise, do you think? <gasps> The only art in filmmaking is the art of compromise. <laughs> uh, Peter Weir said that. Um, and I have been known to say that to directors in the, like at 12 o'clock at night. Um, <laughs> it's a really, really fine art. It is an art. It's a creative art. Um, being able to know when to push for something and when not to. Um, knowing when to say yes, when to say no. Um, I tend to, I, you know, when to say, yeah, I'll look at it. Um, so it, it is a, it's a, yeah, it's a fine art. It's important. Mm. Well, thank you very much. We've got, right. uh, we've got time for a couple of questions. <laughs> Who's got a really great question? Has to be really great. No, I put too much pressure on them and now I've got no questions. <laughs> at the back. Which director? Just back to writer director. So oh, writer okay, directors yeah. versus just writers, writers or just direct, and yeah. or directors. Yeah. So so perhaps the question could be, when do you see them? For, so they're the writer. When do you start pushing them towards thinking like the director? Yeah. Well, it, it's interesting in Australia. There was always a very big tradition of having writer slash directors, and that's if you look at the. That, I mean, that's an auteur approach to cinema, if you like. And um, I think probably in the last five years that's shifted a bit in our industry in that we have started splitting off and there are more writers who are collaborating then with a director. Um, so it's an interesting sort of, in my sort of life career span, that's happened. That's, I started off working mainly with writer-directors. Um, I think that in my... In my current slate, the directors are all working pretty closely with the writer. Um, and I don't know if I have a, I don't know if I have a different, I mean, obviously the processes are slightly different because you've got two people instead of one. Um, but I think you're still approaching, the script still needs to be a fundamentally great piece of document that can show that the film is going to be made to, to um, a great exacting degree. So you're still trying to get a great script out of someone and you're still working with them and trying to encourage them and often using outside people if you need to, script editing. Um, but I think as, as people get more and more busy, it's just a sort of fact that you need to have 
separation a little bit. Mm. And television has indicated that's been a big thing, I think. Thank you. One more. Um, your showreel um, was predominantly dark and gritty, and you mentioned that you're looking doing at comedy. A rom -com, yeah, yeah. And I'm just it's very black, that one. What's that? <laughs> black rom com. It's a black so, rom com. <laughs> so, that, yeah, I suppose I'm, uh, my question is. But we're doing comedy. Is that because you think those are more marketable, or is it just a personal preference? That's been a, I think it's. I think it's been. In the past, it has been a kind of um, a more personal preference, probably, and and we have gone for a kind of art house sort of niche look um, and feel, and we work with those directors, and we've worked on films that are, have a high end kind of um, production value, and we're trying to bring that brand to television, but also expand to have lighter um, comedy, but smart comedy. Mm. How are we going for time? Now it's good to wrap it up. Well, thank you very much, Liz. That's really insightful.